Much of human society is collectively fascinated with interstellar exploration, but the reality is that we've very few practical reasons left to actually send humans beyond our own atmosphere. The massive improvements in observation technology, including telescopes, robotics, and unmanned drones, have made sending astronauts into space more or less obsolete, at least until such a time as we're ready to see life on other planets, and the practicality of that in itself is a little bit debatable. But put a pin in that debate for a different video. It's not what we're talking about today. What we have to talk about is one of the few reasons left to facilitate astronauts, because space travel can be fun. Space tourism is a notion that's been around for centuries. And interest in the idea has to some extent remained consistent since it was first conceivable that exploring space might be possible. The problem is and has always been the justification of the obscene cost and countless skilled work hours to blast people into space. The International Space Station, or ISS, is buzzing with activity and important research is being carried out there as we speak. Expedition 71 began on April the 5th, 2024 and is set to last until September with researchers looking into neurodegenerative diseases, space botany, algae-based life support, and more. So beyond this sort of orbital scientific research, itself probably not requiring humans for much longer, for space tourism to ever widely be available, major innovations have to occur in affordability and the required infrastructure. This means that we're probably a long way off from affordable options. Right? Well, actually, maybe not. Recent predictions say that space tourism is one of the hot new industries, with it being suggested that the market will grow 19.8% annually between 2024 and 2028, ultimately generating around $5 billion annually by 2034. If that's the case, are the breakthroughs at SpaceX and other major aeronautics and astronautics companies on the verge of finally transforming space tourism into something widely accessible? Well, let's find out. <laughs> The concept of achievable space tourism goes back much further than most assume, with the idea being seriously considered as early as the 70s and the 80s. After the excitement of the space race, interstellar exploration was all the rage, and a number of companies were keen on capitalizing, including American megacorporation Rockwell International. In the 70s, the company put forward the concept of a removable cabin that could fit into a shuttle's cargo bay, effectively providing room for around 74 passengers. The passengers were to experience an orbital passage around Earth for up to three days. The design didn't make it beyond the concept stage, but was followed up by a similar idea in 1985 presented by the National Space Society. The organization's presentation suggested that the cost of putting passengers into orbit would initially come in at around $1 to $1.5 million per passenger, but speculation was that spaceflight would get drastically cheaper, and within 15 years, 30,000 people would be making the trip annually, paying the equivalent of $70,000 per person. The National Space Society was so optimistic as to declare lunar orbital trips would be a available in 30 years and lunar surface visits within 50. So imagine this, you're out there looking for the perfect holiday gift or maybe just a little something unique for yourself. Well, let's talk about today's sponsor, Holzken, for a second. They are this family-run company from Austria, uh, specifically in Vienna, and they've been crafting beautiful natural pieces like this since 2016. And their name actually means wood core. And each piece, whether it's made of rich walnut like this one is, or whether it's made from from onyx or even a peacock feather, yes, that's really a thing. It's unique. It's like wearing a little piece of nature on your wrist. And here's the fun part. Since they only use natural materials, no two pieces are exactly alike. So you're not just buying a watch, you're buying something as unique as a fingerprint. And with FSC certified wood, they're serious about sustainability. Holzkern's not just handing out timepieces, they're helping preserve the forests they source them from. And for Black Friday, for a limited time, Holzkern is having their biggest sale of the year, where you can get an exclusive 30% off by clicking my link in the description or the pinned comment. It's a perfect opportunity to find that gift for someone special, or just treat yourself, why not? Plus, free express worldwide shipping, no waiting around. Orders usually sharp in just two to five business days, right from Vienna. Big thank you to Holzkern for sponsoring today's episode, and now back to it. Just before we end today's video, a reminder, a big thank you to Holzkern for sponsoring it. Check out their unique, high-quality products through the link in the description below and get up to 30% off. Limited time offer, and thank you for watching. It all seemed rather feasible at the time, and the world was giddy with anticipation. But take a look around, as you'll notice the absence of space airports. Now you might be wondering, well, what happens? Well, if you know anything about space flights, you'll already know the tragic story of Chris McAuliffe. It was during the 80s that NASA was gearing up to open the space flight participation program to citizens, coinciding with the ambitious plan of starting sending tourists to the moon. 
McAuliffe was part of the 1985 Teacher in Space project, an initiative that received 11,400 applications. The similar Journalist in Space project received 1,700 applications and was set to launch soon after the first. NASA intended that following these initial proof of concept flights, that around two to three civilians would be included on space flights annually. They would act as spearheads as space exploration moved forward. The Space Shuttle Challenger mission STS-51L exploded immediately after takeoff, killing everyone on board, including McAuliffe. Not surprisingly, this very horrific, extremely public disaster somewhat dampened interest in space tourism, all but bringing ambitious future plans to a grinding halt. It's worth mentioning that Barbara Morgan, McAuliffe's backup, did eventually make the trip in 1998. Now, at this point, NASA was giving rather mixed signals about its position on space tourism, with an article dated the 1st of November 2000 sharing the words of NASA spokesman Brian Welch with him declaring, while we're building the ISS, this is not the time to do something like that. In the early part of the program, there's a lot of work to be done and equipment to be installed. It's not a pleasure cruise. The quote ends. This attitude did a rather abrupt 180 in 2001. The Space and Aeronautics Committee on Science and the House of Representatives announced that they were reviewing the issues and opportunities related to flying non-professional astronauts and considering the role that government would play in using the shuttle and International Space Station for tourism. Whatever NASA's intentions were and whatever the organization was hoping for, the plans were once again hastily reconsidered as another very public disaster rocked the aeronautics world. On February the 1st, 2003, the Space Shuttle Columbia disintegrated over Texas and Louisiana, killing all seven astronauts on board. Hopes of accommodating tourists were, very understandably, firmly put on the back burner as the organization once again set about repairing its shattered reputation. But for all the trouble NASA was having, Russia, meanwhile, did not waste any time in opening up new revenue streams for its cash-starved spaceflight industry. As far back as 1990, an offer was accepted from the Tokyo Broadcasting System to fly a reporter to the Mir space station. Toyohiro Akeyama made the trip to Mir, did daily broadcasts, and participated in scientific experiments. The cost of his journey, estimated to be between 10 and $37 million, all covered by Tokyo Broadcasting. Project Juno followed in 1991, with the intention being that chemist Helen Sharman would be the first Briton in space. After some initial trouble with raising funds, the project did eventually go ahead, with Mikhail Gorbachev stepping in to cover costs as a means to promote international relations. A reality TV show titled Destination Mir, championed by Survivor producer Mark Burnett, was scheduled to premiere some point between 2001 and 2004. Burnett would have leased part of the Mir space station via Mir Corp, then uh, would have followed contestants as they competed for a place on a 10-day mission aboard the space station. Destination Mir never happened, and various attempts to reignite it over the years likewise failed. That Russia was willing to lease part of the Mir space station should make a few things very clear. Namely, that human spaceflight and interstellar exploration in general was struggling with funding and relevance. At least, it was struggling with funding and relevance until fairly recently. Now, technically speaking, Toyohiro Akiyama and Helen Sharman weren't space tourists by definition. Although non-government astronauts entering the space program, they performed science experiments and other journalistic duties, meaning they were payload specialists according to the rules and regulations. So, space tourism essentially only really started in April 2001 with American businessman Dennis Tito. He flew aboard a Russian Soyuz TM-32 spacecraft and visited a segment of the ISS, staying aboard for nearly eight days. Following a successful journey, an additional six space tourists followed between 2001 and 2009, facilitated by American company Space Adventure. The price paid for each tourist was between $20 and $25 million. But even still, by 2007, the buzz surrounding space tourism was again palpable. As it was in the 80s, expectations were that space tourism would quickly become a whole viable new industry, and the world braced in anticipation. However, Russia halted all space tourism in 2009 due to an increase in the size of the active scientific crew aboard the ISS. Russian officials did declare that orbital tourist flights would resume in 2015, but that plan was abruptly cancelled. Russian orbital tourism eventually reopened in 2021, and NASA announced it would start accepting tourists in 2020. But neither have been doing anything close to brisk business, and the grand total of all space tourists, not including those that have simply travelled a certain distance above sea level, technically making them astronauts, is 21. That's the original seven in the early 2000s, plus 14 since, making pretty clear that the words hot new industry and space tourism don't exactly belong in the same sentence. On the other hand, each of those 14 space tourists paid around $50 million plus an additional $35,000 per day, and some went on more than one trip. 
So even if space tourism isn't particularly inclusive, it's certainly helping NASA cover those costs. This more or less brings us to the present day. And to call the current state of space tourism confusing, it's a bit of an understatement. There are three major players, Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic, and SpaceX, all incredibly well-funded and each backed by a big corporate name. That's Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson, and Elon Musk, respectively. So let's go through each, figure out what's going on, and decide if you should be preparing for your trip around the moon. Let's kick off with perhaps the most recognizable of the three, SpaceX. You're probably aware that SpaceX loves the media spotlight, and it goes without saying that something related to the company has probably slapped you in the face, whether you were looking for it or not. Even at the time of this script being researched and written, an impressive new video was published depicting the super heavy booster being caught mid-air after an initial launch. It is, as far as space tourism is concerned, exactly this sort of reusable spaceflight technology that could make space travel more affordable and therefore more broadly accessible. But do the current technological advancements indicate that we're finally entering into a viable space tourism era? Well, no, probably not. As far as SpaceX is concerned, you're still not getting a trip into space unless you fork over tens of millions or even an estimated 500 plus million dollars if the trip to the moon sold to Japanese billionaire Yasaku Maezawa is to be believed. There have been a few remarks and vague promises by SpaceX regarding space tourism, and some of the successful tourists have even traveled on the company's Crew Dragon. But the reality is that space tourism is not a priority for SpaceX, other than as a publicity stunt. It probably won't be for some time. To put it bluntly, SpaceX isn't strapped for cash, having landed multiple hundred billion dollar NASA contracts, and the company technicians are presently very focused on developing reusable space flight technology for NASA, not for tourism. Now, this isn't either the company won't expand into tourism. I mean, it probably will at some point, but that expansion is still likely a long way away. We'll only go ahead on the basis of a few major advancements in spacecraft reusability. Plus, even then, the prices likely still won't be affordable for the average person. While SpaceX spends more time in the spotlight than Blue Origin, if you thought a company owned by Jeff Bezos was anything less than a behemoth, you'd have been mistaken. The company was awarded a $3.4 billion NASA contract for the Artemis program, otherwise known as the project to establish a human presence on the moon and has received the Robert J. Collier Trophy. The Collier Trophy is an accolade administered by the US National Aeronautics Association for, quote, the greatest achievement in aeronautics or astronautics in America with respect to improving the performance, efficiency, and safety of air or space vehicles, the value of which has been thoroughly demonstrated by actual use during the preceding year. To put it in a nutshell, Blue Origin is an enormously successful company that has its fingers in more pies than we care to list here. In fact, strap yourself in for some exciting news. One of the projects Blue Origin is currently involved in is called Orbital Reef, and it happens to be a commercial low Earth orbit space station. More exciting still is that Orbital Reef is set to officially launch in 2027, meaning that it's just a few years until the first entirely tourism-based space station is possibly available. Blue Origin partnered with Sierra Space, which will provide large integrated flexible environments or life modules, as well as Boeing, which will provide a science module and the Starliner crew spacecraft, plus Redwire Space, which will provide deployable structures. Genesis Engineering and Arizona State University are also involved with Genesis providing a single person spacecraft aimed specifically at tourist excursions. Now, if all of this has you giddy with excitement, we hate to be the bearers of bad news. First, the good news. NASA reportedly paid out $24 million of a $130 million contract in October of 2023, indicating that the company achieved some milestones. However, CNBC was quick to point out that the Orbital Reef website hasn't been updated in over a year and that no specialized hiring is occurring on the parts of either Sierra Space or Blue Origin. CNBC speculated that the lack of buzz was likely due to both companies being far more concerned with much bigger, far more lucrative projects, and that Orbital Reef was being treated as something of an afterthought. We can't say whether this is true, but we can suggest that if a commercial space station was due to be launched in three years, that there might have been a bit more buzz. Chances are, Orbital Reef will be delayed. There's also no indication of what it might cost to visit Orbital Reef, assuming that it does eventually become available. And last, we come to Virgin Galactic, the only company with a primary focus on space tourism, and if we're being realistic, the only company keeping hopes that space tourism will one day be affordable alive, or at least on a level that millionaires can afford rather than just billionaires. Now, we say keeping hopes alive, but Virgin Galactic isn't taking any tourists into space at the moment and probably won't be again until at least 2026. 
You might find this timeline rather surprising, especially since the company boasted that 640 customers signed up in 2013 at a cost of a quarter million dollars per person. Sadly, none of those 640 passengers have yet enjoyed a trip, and well, if your hopes for near-future affordable space tourism were pegged on Virgin Galactic, unfortunately we once again have to tell you to rein in that excitement. Virgin Galactic has been surrounded by, shall we say, shenanigans, with violations of Federal Aviation Administration protocols, the death of one test pilot, the serious injury of another, as well as a decade of broken promises by billionaire owner Richard Branson. Now, we're not going to go into all of the details of this right now, but let's just say that if you were one of those to sign up in 2013, you probably got sick of hearing the phrase, in a year or two. On the other hand, while the list of the company's failures is rather long, we must also acknowledge that Virgin Galactic is the first corporation in the world to successfully launch an independent commercial space flight. The initial test flight occurred on July the 11th, 2021, with Richard Branson himself on board the Unity 22. Unity 22 managed to breach the 80 kilometer of a 50 mile barrier, which indicates space according to the US definition, officially putting Virgin Galactic into the history books. Branson, the two pilots, and three employee passengers experienced weightlessness for a full three minutes, with the entire journey lasting about an hour. At that time in 2021, Virgin Galactic reported that it had 600 commercial passengers signed up, though with the price per passenger ramped up significantly to $450,000. Following the test flight, the first commercial flight to include tourists took place on the 29th of June 2023, uh, with three members of the Italian military riding along in a passenger capacity. The successful flight lasted 70 minutes and once again put Virgin Galactic in the history books. Following that flight, Virgin Galactic updated its backlog to specify that it now had 800 confirmed customers. Additional successful commercial flights occurred over the remaining months of 2023, plus two more in 2024 for a total of seven. It was then announced that the Unity aircraft would be retired and that work would begin on a replacement, with predictions saying that a newer model would be ready for commercial operations in 2026. All right, so let's stop beating around the bush and get to the obvious conclusion. And we're sorry to say that space tourism really isn't just planning out like the science fiction films of old promised. While the technology is gradually getting better and reusable rockets are creating interesting potential, it's unlikely that traveling into space will ever become as accessible as air travel, at least not for the foreseeable future. The bottom line is that launching rockets into space is always going to be really bloody expensive, and since there's no reason to even go into space right now other than it's fun, space tourism is not going to be anything other than millionaires bungee jumping for decades, or shall we say for at least 50 years. In the meantime, let's at least enjoy the fact that the spaceflight industry is moving along at a rather astonishing rate, and that the technological advancements happening now, even if they don't include space tourism, do seem to suggest the possibility of a moon base relatively soon.